if I am going to finance growth, a company's growth, I want to finance a company's in the insurance industry as well. I want to finance a company's growth by understanding the risks associated with that growth. If I don't understand those risks, then it's very hard for me to be competitive with financing or to even access financing. Welcome to the Innovation and in Compliance Podcast, part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Join us every week as we talk with industry innovators who are making compliance to help business run more efficiently and at the end of the day, more profitably. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And today you're in for a real treat because I have Richard Blundell. Richard has been in and around sustainability, I'm going to say, since he backpacked in Europe, since I know you did that, having watched one of your presentations. I won't say how long ago, but it was similar to the last time I backpacked in Europe. <laughs> so Richard, with that incredibly long-winded introduction, first of all, welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. It's a delight, Tom. Thanks so much for having me. So Richard, could you give us a little bit of a taste of your professional background? Sure, Tom. So I've essentially done two things. I've led global businesses for multinationals in Europe and Asia. They've all been in the environmental technology or services space. And I've been involved with startups for, I guess, about 30 years, all of which have pretty much been in the clean tech space. And I've been either an advisor or a senior executive or founder in well over a dozen. And I've helped raise over a half billion dollars of financing over the course of my career. As you said, I've been in sustainability all my life. I was at Rio in 1992, the first real global discussion on this issue, and I've sort of been in and around this all my life. And then lastly, I, I have some advisory roles with the Prince of Wales charity, which is called Accounting for Sustainability, Canadian Centre for Regenerative Agriculture, and I'm an advisor to the Danish government on embedding sustainability into the high school curriculum so that we get kids better prepared for the jobs that they're likely to have once they graduate. So Richard, one of the main reasons I am so excited about ESG as a concept is I see it as a business process and a way to make more efficient business processes within each letter. But you see sustainability as a huge business opportunity. So I was really intrigued when I was first introduced to you and wanted to start off with really what I'm going to call the business case. And why is sustainability better for businesses than a carbon-based business model, recognizing that I grew up in, professionally in Houston, Texas, and worked in the energy space for 40 years? There are lots of answers. This is not a short answer. But the reality is that the business case is very strong. It's manifested in things like lower costs, less waste, and more resource efficiency, more energy efficiency or resource efficiency, and better quality jobs. So if you take a look at your industry, where you come from, that part of Texas, we look at oil and gas and we look at renewable energy. Renewable energy now employs three to four times the number of people employed in the oil and gas sector, and they tend to be better paying jobs. The other thing that around sustainability, because sustainability is built around building purpose-led organizations is that it delivers much better employee engagement around purpose. So people actually know what they're working towards, the purpose of what they do every day. It provides better and more access to capital with many different asset classes. Now we see things like green bonds, transition bonds, impact investing, which is the highest growth asset class today in finance. It endears better and longer-term relationships with customers suppliers, better relationship with community stakeholders. It delivers better innovation, better products, and better performance in public markets. And that's well documented. I mean, I think UBS did a study of 2,500 studies that looked at financial outcomes or public market financial outcomes. And they determined that companies that had purpose at the core of their business strategies and that had sustainability embedded into their business strategies had a lower cost of capital and a lower cost of debt. So there's a lot of reasons, and we're going to talk about some of those around scope one, two, and three, and we'll talk about financing as well. In 2018, the United States Business Roundtable issued a document entitled Statement on the Purpose of a Corporation. And in that document, they expanded the definition of stakeholders in an organization from simply shareholders to the other groups you named in addition to shareholders. employees customers, third parties, 
localities and having a business strategy which touches on all of those, whether it be purpose-led or purpose-driven or other business strategy is exactly what business leaders are saying we need to do as businesses to drive forward. Would that be consistent with what you're saying? Oh, absolutely. I mean, a really good spokesman on this topic is Larry Fink, the largest asset manager in the world. I I don't remember how many trillions they have under management, but, you know, he'll tell you that if you don't deliver a meaningful outcome to society, you'll actually lose the support of your shareholders and your stakeholders within the communities that you operate. So you won't actually get access to financing. The reality is that those stakeholder relationships have dramatically changed. And there's something in sustainability that we measure of that interaction called materiality. And materiality is essentially a way for a company to determine its priorities, its strategic priorities around its decarbonization or its ESG goals or its sustainability impacts it's trying to deliver. Essentially, it's a measure. It's a matrix. It's a measure of what's important to the corporation and what's important to its stakeholders. So for the first time in a long time, we now actually incorporate into strategy and determining priority what the materiality is around what's important for our stakeholders as well as what's important for our business. You used a phrase, a purpose-led organizations. Could you discuss the example I've heard you utilize of Unilever as how that impacts employee engagement and what happened to Unilever after they made their public announcement of focusing on sustainability? So I think Paul Pullman is one of the really great leaders of my generation from a corporate standpoint. He created something called Sustainable Living, which was a strategy that they embarked upon. Gee, it's got to be at least 15, 20 years ago now. And he had very bold goals. Those goals were built around taking people out of poverty, making a positive impact on, I think, a billion people within their communities that they operate. They also had some very lofty economic goals, like doubling their revenue within a decade. And so what he did was he built an organization around those goals. One of the things that was really interesting that happened is when he made that announcement, their website crashed for about, I think it was about two weeks, day after day. And it wasn't because there was a technical glitch. It was because so many people were applying for jobs that it overloaded their system. And Paul will tell you that sort of two things. They don't pay the same salaries that the financial sector does. But when you're in an organization and you're working towards those kinds of social and environmental and economic outcomes, because all three matter, it invigorates, it energizes the organization. And what his observation was, was that he got a little bit more energy out of the organization, more than he would normally get. The way that he described that is, It's going from being a good company to a great company because the employee base is so energized and so excited and the goals are so breathtaking. Ray Anderson did this at Interface saying when you create a goal that is so lofty and at the outset sort of almost impossible to achieve, it actually delivers a huge amount of energy into the organization. You've used a phrase that I had not heard before, which was, I think I wrote this down right, that sustainability can be a life insurance policy for the planet. If I wrote that down correctly, could you explain what that means? So the problem with sustainability in my life is that it's been selling death insurance for too long. What I mean by that is the stories around sustainability, uh, loss of biodiversity, loss of habitat, all those, the weather stories, the catastrophic stories around migration of people, which is largely being driven by drought and environmental catastrophes. And you see what happened with Pakistan, a third of the country's underwater. It's all those doom and gloom stories, and they're so depressing. But the reality is that there's a really important life insurance story here. And the life insurance story is that climate change is the single largest commercial opportunity of our time. Depending on who you listen to, it's approximately a $100 trillion opportunity between now and 2050. I mean, what other industries do you have that kind of a commercial opportunity? It's just absolutely enormous. I think I wanted to maybe change focus a little bit and ask you, what are six key global challenges you see currently 
for transforming our world? I've actually added another. I've got seven. But the key challenges that we're facing right now that's transforming our world are around digitalization. So the fourth industrial revolution sort of technologies that we see, IoT, AI, AR, all those technologies are creating an exponential pace of change in the marketplace, which means that, I mean, this notion of sustained competitive advantage no longer really exists. It's really all about transient competitive advantage. It's about your ability to get into and out of markets very quickly. The next one is around globalization, but that's changed, right? I think it's changed in the last two or three years, particularly with COVID and now with some of the geopolitics that we see. But there's an increasing globalization from the first issue, digitalization, because of the digital tools and the accelerating pace of adoption of those tools. But there's a stronger local focus now because of geopolitics. And I think there's probably also a lack of mobility, which is wealth related, because there's a tremendous amount of inequity today. And we see that. I mean, the U.S. is a very good example of that. And then we've had closed borders, right? I think a lot of that's had to do with COVID, but some of it also with immigration. The third one is around urbanization. So, you know, by 2050, three quarters of the world's populations will now be living in cities. So that's in itself an enormous challenge. There's a tremendous amount of social inequity. So that means, and we see this, and we've seen it with George Floyd and Black Lives Matter and in other movements. So it's very important that this transition that we do to a low carbon economy or a low carbon world is a just transition. In other words, it has to work for everybody at all stratas of society. The next is demographic change. And this, I think, is a really, really important one for everybody to understand. So majority of the workforce is made up of Generation Z, Generation Z, as a Canadian would say, and millennials. I think we're now, that group is now the majority of the global workforce. But one of the things that's happening with that group is that they're going to witness the largest transfer of wealth. It's a $59 trillion transfer of wealth into their hands over the next 20 years. And the good news from a climate perspective is that this group of, or this strata of of society really cares about this issue. They care about sustainability. They care about climate change. They care about clean energy. They care about social equity. So those are really good things. Obviously, climate change is the sixth of those, and we're now in the midst of what we call the sixth mass extinction event, which is actually happening at paces that we've never seen before in the other five mass extinction events, about 100 times faster. So we've lost about 40% of the natural world, and most of those, a lot of populations are danger. And so if we're going to fix this and we're going to take advantage of the opportunity, Breakthrough technology on average takes about 20 years to get to market. Well, we don't have 20 years. It's great news about cold fusion recently, but still getting that to scale, that's at least another couple of decades away. So we have to look at other sort of opportunities. And my view is that we've got a lot of the technology that we need to actually combat climate change and take advantage of the enormous commercial opportunity. It's mostly now about really business model innovation. And then lastly, and the one that I would add, is wellness and health. I think that's a very important challenge that is transforming our world because we're becoming more conscious about both our physical health and obviously COVID has had a very significant impact on our mental health. And I think in my country, in Canada, we're on the cusp of a mental health crisis that we are completely unprepared to deal with. I'd like to now ask you some questions about financing around sustainability, but I want to break it down into maybe two parts. Part one would be financing by people like you and I as shareholders, Mm -hmm. financial institutions, banks, hedge funds, private equity, government, perhaps funding. But they'd also like to, in maybe another part, take a look at companies and do they understand that to unlock the value of their organizations through private equity fundraising, through hedge fund fundraising, and also simply issuing new shares or going to banks or even insurance companies who may help them manage risk? Do they understand they need to have sustainability programs, ESG type programs so that they can unlock the value of their organization to get additional capital to move forward? I think on the surface that they do, but it's a really important topic to understand. 
So let's just take a look at it from the bank standpoint. If I am going to finance growth, a company's growth, I want to finance a company's in the insurance industry as well. I want to finance a company's growth by understanding the risks associated with that growth. If I don't understand those risks, then it's very hard for me to be competitive with financing or to even access financing. The one thing that decarbonization does is it lowers a company's risks because they become much more resource efficient, less waste, lower costs, better performance in terms of innovation, better products, better features on their products. Those sorts of things matter because it reduces the risk of a lender to look at lending into an organization that's growing. And it could be lending through debt. It could be an investment in equity. It could be project financing. This is where the banks have a, an enormous opportunity to innovate. If they were to go out and actually listen to their customers and listen to what does a decarbonization journey look like and how can we help you get there by designing tools that fit that transition rather than trying to stuff it into an old box with an old set of criteria that actuarials have designed like 50 years ago, which don't apply today. And even with just the pace of digital innovation, those guys need to get up to speed, right? So let's go and take a look at what's happening around scope one, two, and three, if you don't mind. Scope one is the energy or the emissions associated with the energy that I use directly on my facilities that I own or lease. Scope two is the energy that I purchase from a third party and it's those emissions, but that energy is used directly for my, my purposes. Scope three is everything else, everything that I don't have control over. So that's my supply chain and that's my customers. When Jane Fraser, who's the CEO of Citibank, came out and said, we're gonna make a net zero commitment a scope three net zero commitment, and we're going to use our financing as a tool to actually help our customers make that transition to a low carbon state or low carbon economy. That's extremely powerful. And what that says is that if you don't have a low carbon or a decarbonization transition strategy in place, you're not going to get access to capital. And if you listen to people like Larry Fink and others, the hedge fund guys and the big asset managers, they're saying the same thing. If you're not going to provide a benefit to society, if you're not going to have a decarbonization plan, you're not going to get access to financing because you know why? I don't understand the risks associated with that growth if I don't have you committed to a decarbonization plan. When Mike gave some thoughts a little bit earlier about how I saw ESG as a business process system, that really was encapsulated by scopes one, scope two, scope three. Because mm -hmm. the first time I heard someone explain that in a way that I understood it, it struck me as number one, you're finally measuring something mm -hmm. and you're getting data. And once you get data, you can approve it, you can risk rank it, you can manage it, you can monitor it and hopefully improve it. But by having scope one, scope two, scope three, now you have a company or a corporate function within an entity looking at that in a much more holistic way, perhaps even up to the board of directors. And so when I started seeing things like that, it dawned on me, this really is, is process improvement. And I'm a huge process guy. So when I hear you say those things, it just drives home to, I hear process. I, that's to me, what's so exciting about this. That's a good observation, Tom. It is all about process. I learned this from a very savvy, very successful serial entrepreneur many years ago. And he told me that it's process over genius every day. And what he meant by that was you can have all the smart people you want in a room, but that doesn't guarantee that you're going to solve the problem or that you're going to build a great business. In fact, chances are that if you have too many smart people in the room, they're going to tell you why things can't be done. So He's right when he says it's process over genius. It's all about process. And a lot of people say that process that repeats itself over time is a little bit like culture. It actually becomes the culture of a business. So process is super important. And this is all about, it's very much a process-driven approach to looking at resource efficiency at the end of the day. But layered on top of that, which is very important, is this notion of purpose and values and beliefs. Those things matter because they matter to the people who work in companies. They matter to the people that buy your products. You know, you'll hear 
people like Simon Sinek that people don't buy what you produce or how you produce something. They buy why you produce it. It's really about understanding your why. And that's where all of the excitement around engagement and how you build really great cultures and great companies, it's understanding why you're doing something. And if you can start there and build purpose around it, you're on the right track. But, oh, sorry, not purpose, process. To get back to what you're saying, I apologize. Process. Yeah. Let me turn to the circular economy and circular growth. Could you explain what those terms mean and how they relate to sustainability? Yeah, sure. So circular economy or circular growth is the notion that all inputs and outputs are held at their highest utility throughout their life cycle, which means that one output from my process might be an input for somebody else. It really is, again, around process. It's around resource efficiency, and it's about eliminating waste. And so if you can build a circular business, you're building a business that actually doesn't produce waste or the waste that it does produce is actually used by somebody else as an input. And just a note on getting back to financing. So very interestingly, not long ago, Morgan Stanley actually did the first really large circular bond. It is a billion dollars, which they issued to PepsiCo to eliminate plastics in their bottles, virgin plastics, right? To encourage them to actually find ways to recycle plastics and make sure they don't end up in microparticles in the ocean, et cetera. That's a very good example of a financial institution recognizing the opportunity around single-use plastics and the opportunity to go to one of the biggest users of single-use plastics and provide them with a financial incentive to get them to change their behavior around their bottle. A little bit earlier, you mentioned the term, the fourth industrial revolution. I was wondering if you could explain that a little more and why you see that tied so closely into sustainability down the road. So one of the things that the fourth industrial revolution does is it's really typified by its intelligence, basically making things smarter. If you want to pair right, like there's a lot of other things. There's a new IT architecture, which is built around the Internet of Things, and we can get into the weeds very quickly, but let's just stay at a high level. What it's basically saying is that things are getting smarter and things are more connected. Those are the two things that you just really need to know about digitalization. We're more connected and things are getting smarter. So if you take that and you apply that to sustainability, they're very meaningful because what we want to do with the existing technology and the existing processes that we have in place is to actually make them smarter and more connected so that we continue to learn and that we can be prescriptive in actually identifying faults or failures in the system and avoid those from happening. So this fourth industrial revolution, which is all about connectivity and intelligence, is also moving at a pace that we're not accustomed to, like our ability to actually govern those technologies, those technologies, their growth surpassed that more than a decade ago. And so it's now our ability to see how can we actually use those technologies to make those systems and technologies to make what we have today better, smarter, and more resource efficient. Why do you say that sustainability is both a mindset and a journey? Because it really is a mind. It gets back to that life insurance story. It's a mindset because we have to get out of this mindset of it's all doom and gloom. That's all we ever hear. You know, you open the television today and all you hear about is these extreme weather events. You hear about deaths. You hear about property destruction. You hear about all these very negative things. And the reality is that the opportunity is just so enormous and so exciting that you have to change your mindset. I think Interface, getting back to Interface, which is a commercial carpet tile company, I think, you know, one of the really leading, early leading companies and Ray Anderson at the time, the CEO leading advocates for sustainability, they have continuously gone on this journey. The first part of their journey was something they called Mount Sustainability. I think it had seven or eight steps or something like that. And the last one was to reimagine commerce, which they got to. And then the new one is actually building a world that's fit for carbon. So what they've done is their products now sequester carbon. Their factories, some of the materials that they use on the cladding of their factories sequester carbon. So they're actually building products that will work in a world that has excess atmospheric carbon and actually sequester some of it, take some of it out of the air. And so that's a really interesting and breathtaking sort of next step for them as a company. Nike has made a similar type of commitment. So these are journeys that just have no end because as we learn more, 
we innovate more and we can actually stretch our targets. Whereas innovation is actually a destination. Innovation is a destination because it's usually a business model, profit outcome. So it's got, you know, there's kind of like a hard stop, right? But with sustainability, it really has to be as we learn more and we grow more and we get better at understanding how to drive efficiency and process into this decarbonization journey, there's the opportunity to keep stretching targets. And you see the best companies in the world continuously do that. Richard, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode. But before we leave, I wanted to ask if our listeners wanted any more information on yourself or really any of the topics we've touched on today, what would be the best place for them to go? Well, first of all, Tom, thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure. And I think we could have talked a lot longer. It's a great topic, and I'm really grateful for having time with you. The best is to find me on LinkedIn. So my full name is Richard Blundell. I've got a LinkedIn. You can find me on there. I teach at the University of Toronto's business school, the Rotman School of Management. That's another place you can find me. You know, you can write to me on my Gmail email, which is richard.rpbsustainability at gmail.com. You know, I love doing these. I'm happy to come and talk to, I regularly talk to executives and companies. Uh, I do a lot of talking to young people and business schools and business professionals and do a lot of work with companies that are either early stage or growth companies with their business models and their go-to-market strategies. So happy to help. Richard, I've really enjoyed this time. Uh, I hope we can continue this conversation. I do too. Thank you, Tom. If you want to stay up to date on the latest innovations in compliance and help your business run more efficiently, subscribe to this podcast and help spread the word by leaving a review.